Okay. Okay. Thank you. I will consider. I will, I will be ready. Thank you. Andy, you are coming here to listen to my seminar. Sorry, I didn't answer because I was uh, hiking in the Grand Titans. I was trying to forget that I'm uh, yeah. I'm 65 yeah. and I went up uh, more than 2,000 meters, more than 3,000 feet. And I was 32 kilometers and uh, 1,350 elevation. Uh, Thanks for coming. It was nice. It was good. I would also yeah, I go. I've been going to like restaurants and and people, uh, you know, like later comes, they go away. I start saying, so don't they? You know, they can't help. It's like kind of back again. And you ask, so you think you're through Russia? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have to get to myself every Christmas. I figured like lots of people know how to say thank you, hi, and other people. So you can uh, you can prepare a deal or Thank you. 
significant number of really good scientists, those who uh, make good solid rock. But there are only few who really make destructive changes, who basically open new fields. And uh, what uh, clearly belongs to this class of brilliant scientists who are actually making a difference uh, that save the history of time. So I just to recall a few contributions, or we say first observation, like uh, doing this two-dimensional uh, discrete solid forms for the first time, first observation of under electrization of light, first observation of uh, uh, photonic topology, uh, topological insulators, and many, many others. And uh, not surprisingly, his research uh, he created his number of uh, recognitions and awards. He is a, a member of Israeli National Academy of Science. He is a foreign member of National Academy of Science of this country. He got major awards from all, uh, let's say, all societies that matter. American Physical Society, the Optica Society, uh, the European Physical Society. It would take too long time just to list all these big awards. And I think it's actually a privilege for Purdue 
to have so outstanding uh, person uh, as a new outstanding distinguished professor. And uh, today he will be talk talking about photonic time crystals, which in my biased opinion is the most exciting things which is going on now in uh, the field of politics. Please uh, join me and welcome Professor Montesquieu. Thank you, my friends. Um, I'm humbled. And I really, you know, it's been now, I think, uh, towards the end of the third year that I've been coming here quite a bit as a visiting uh, professor. And I developed collaborations there with uh, many good people, actually. And I'm excited about that. And several good papers are now being written, not only with Vlad and Sasha, but also with Dimitri Perulis and Chen Long. And uh, there will be more. Hopefully we, we get out something in the middle. It's nice to be here, nice to be in such a place. So I'll talk a little bit about photonic time crystals. And I want first of all to mention my students, uh, Ryan Lustig, who started this, is now a postdoc with Shambhu Pan at Stanford, Rod Segal is the guy that leads the project now. There are two that three that graduated, the other Sharabi is now in the high tech, unfortunately. I was not able to convince him to do to go for postdoc, he had a very good offer. But he decided he wants to go to algo training because what he was good at is simulations. Just to give you a, a scale of this, you know, there are today there are commercial FDTD uh, codes that uh, solve Maxwell equations and linear, non linear medium, whatever, in real time and space. And he developed much better codes because we didn't trust, we found flaws in the, all the codes that are there in the non linear, the linearities. And, but still, he wanted to do algo training to make money. So, what can do? Alex Nikopolce, who is now a postdoc with uh, ETH Zurich. Kobe Lumen is in, uh, in the industry also. And these are younger students, you know, especially this kid is only 20, huh? only 20, started his uh, PhD now. Extremely talented kid and doing parallel to our service. And I collaborate on this project uh, with Vlad and Sasha, and there are several people here. It started with Soham, and Koto, Mustafa, and Sarah. So there's a lot to say. If that, what's this business? Oh, it's a weird one. You have to press the opposite way. You can move. What? Yeah. Okay. I can do with this. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Did it get frozen? It's frozen. Since the zoom is working, you can't do anything. It was good. What about your last? You can use your last two if you like. Uh, with this? Yeah. Okay. Oh. There we go. Uh, yeah. No. Okay. And then, yeah. Now? Yeah. No. And then click the other one. Yeah. No. 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 Slow, slow. <laughs> computer is not as. I would walk with this. There we go. I would walk yeah. with this with computer, not with the clicker. I should have used mine. Anyway, so I'm talking about photonic time crystals. So let's talk about crystals first. So crystals, the way we view them and we know them are repeating structures. So imagine that you have a system, let's say of atoms, and they have some periodicity. So what we know from the physics of uh, solid state physics in the second year of undergraduate is that when we have a repeating structure, it gives us bands and uh, dispersion relations, the relation between momentum and energy that has band gaps, bands and gaps, and so on and so forth. Sometimes the crystals, the way we find them, we find them in nature, and they form spontaneously, like for example, salt and all the other things. Yeah, unmanaged, yeah. unmanaged gas. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and sometimes we need to make them artificially. For example, photonic crystals. Yes, you can find some uh, ideas or concepts related to photonic crystals on the wings of a butterfly, but usually we make them uh, artificially. So what are photonic crystals, usual photonic crystals? There are structures, if everybody knows, there are structures that the active index for the speed of light is structured periodically. So this is one-dimensional photonic crystals, okay? So this is uh, epsilon one, epsilon two, and so on and so forth. And this is a two-dimensional photonic crystal, which means that now it's like wires, uh, different layers of, uh, of active index. And this is a three-dimensional photonic crystal. So it turns out that if you have a three-dimensional photonic crystal like this, then you can get a you can get a band gap, 
what does it mean that you have a band gap? It means that if you have this photonic crystal and there's a frequency in the band gap and you try to come to it at some angle, it will always be reflected. If you change the angle, it's always reflected. And you change the angle again, and it's always reflected. In other words, it never penetrates. To do, to do that, to have a full band gap in a photonic crystal, what you need is that the change of epsilon should occur on the magnitude of, on the order of one, and the periodicity should be the periodicity on the order of a single wavelength. Okay. Now, photonic crystals are known since low gravity, maybe before. And after that, you know, they were not told this way, they had some other names. And if you go then later on, photonic crystals, you'll find photonic crystals also in 1978, at, until, 1990, until uh, 1980, by uh, Pochier and Amnon Yarif, and they invented the photonic crystal fiber, which looks like an onion. You have some in the middle is hollow, and then on top of it, you have some uh, some layers of M1, M2, M1, M2, or epsilon 1, epsilon 2, and so forth. And you can actually use it. You can guide light in the hollow part so that you can use it for delivering high power waves. This was all invented by a little Pochier. And still, they did not invent photonic crystals. And if you go further, then Phil Russell, several years later, had block molds and so on and so forth. And still, they did not invent photonic crystals. The big revolution came from Ilya Blonovich in 1987. And this is probably one of the most cited papers in the history of optics. It has about 20,000 citations. And the reason is that he looked at light matter interaction. And what he said is the following that if we have a three dimensional photonic crystal, which is obeys this, in other words, you have this periodicity on the order of a single wavelength, and the change in the index, the index contrast is actually two because you have two polarizations. Then what happens now is that we already understand that it looks like an omnidirectional mirror. But if you come from outside and try to, this is my photonic crystal, you try any, any end of any polarization, you try to, to get into it, you cannot penetrate in, in the frequencies in the band. -aid. So what he did, he reversed the idea. He said, well, let's say that I have an emitter, an atom that emits light, exactly the frequency, exactly the, in that uh, uh, band. -aid. What will happen to it? Well, he found out that it would not emit. In other words, it can suppress spontaneous emission completely. In other words, what he did, he didn't look just at the electromagnetic properties of photonic crystal, he looked at light matter interactions in photonic crystal. And that created the whole revolution because <coughs> the consequence of that is that you can have uh, you can have now photonic crystal lasers that have no threshold, and you can have all kinds of interesting events and things in linear and nonlinear optics, everything because of light matter interaction. And this is from his first paper. A spontaneous emission, interestingly, is a quantum phenomenon. You cannot explain it classically. You can characterize it, give some lifetime. But fundamentally, it's a quantum phenomenon. There's no H bar in Yablonovich's paper at all. It's just intuition, just descriptive. And still, he gets the credit and rightfully so. There's another guy that sometimes his name is linked in the same year to, to the photonic crystals, but I actually dispute that. So that's so that's the story of the crystal. So when I started to get into this field, what I had in mind is this: Why I wanted to know what happens to time crystals, and look at specifically at light matter interactions, and I'll be very specific. Okay, so this is ordinary crystals, and I mentioned that this, and I talked about the Abramovich's paper, just that you have the perspective. But what happens in the time crystal? So consider a material that is completely homogeneous. So think about it like a box, okay? Completely homogeneous. And then you change the refractive index in time, epsilon one, epsilon two, epsilon one, epsilon two. In other words, you change the speed of light in the medium periodically in time. When you do that, as I will show you, you now have you reverse, you rotate the dispersion relation. And now when you look at the relation between the frequency and uh, the wave number or frequency and momentum, and momentum, you find now that now you have dispersion bands and you have band gaps in momentum. And they are fundamentally different than in ordinary photonic crystals. Now, in order to have band gap in momentum, what you need is an abrupt change. You need that the change in the refractive index will be of order one, and it will happen within one or two cycles. It cannot be slower because otherwise you kill the effects. And how do you handle this theoretically? Well, you use boundary conditions that are similar, are exactly the ones that we use, the continuity of the displacements, electric and magnetic. Now the ideas of this started in 1958 
a microwave is actually an antenna theory by Morgenthal. Then later on, there were some uh, initial thoughts about what, what happens at the time interface by Bianca Lana in 2007. The next one is an interesting story. This is Peter Alevi. His real name is Peretz Alevi. This is a, a guy that uh, uh, was a Holocaust survivor. He was, uh, he was hidden by his mother during the Second World War in former Yugoslavia. And then he immigrated to Israel. And uh, then he changed his name to Peretz Alevi instead of Peter Alevi. And then he did a PhD at the Technion, where I am from and uh, went to the US for postdoc. And what happened to him is what happened to many is that he was not able to find a position in university in Israel, so he went to Mexico. He's now 89 years old. He spent now a year of sabbatical at the Technion in my building. We hosted him and he is surprised at 19, 89 years, you can still do good science. He still publishes good papers, fully coherent, fully focused. Wonderful to have him now. You don't have any done paper that good now. So this is where it's a very year actually if I omit some of the the concept here. The next thing that happened is that Vlad came to visit me in 2016, and they just submitted a paper to clear. Now he was not aware of all of this. My students told me about this, and uh, he was um, disappointed to see. He thought that he discovered the uh, time crystals. But unfortunately, he discovered that it had a very first. My students told him and decided not to publish the paper. So some of the results, I think, are new ideas. Yeah? Already are here in this. But we did the experiment. How did we do it? Yeah, no, I did it. It doesn't fit. I did it in an hour. And uh, the next one after that is the paper that I had with my students, Iran and Nathan Sharabi in Optica. By the way, that paper is highly cited today. It was rejected from PRL because they, they thought, they first thought it's, it's not inspiring enough or not novel enough or something like this. Today it has hundreds of citations. Anyway, so there's sometimes it's interesting how things evolve. So, okay, so how do you handle all of the theory here? So there is duality in time and space when you look at the wave equation. So the duality is, is, is a very similar. So we can learn a lot from the way that we handle one dimensional photonic crystals to one dimensional photonic time crystals that are fundamentally one dimensional. And using this boundary condition. But I want to mention again that if you want to see the effects, then epsilon must change very, very fast and the very large change. The implications are huge. As I will show later, you can have it with a lot of hardship in RF and microwaves. It is almost impossible. It was thought to be impossible to do it in the optical domain. There are papers written. One of them is by a friend of ours, uh, Yasha, Jacob Hogan, that wrote that it's impossible. And I will explain to you why he thought it's impossible and why we were able to win this because we did not think like him. And that sometimes it's an experimental, it's a, it's a, a lesson to the young people. Don't always take what's written in the papers very seriously. You know, consider it seriously, but don't think that it is given by God because it is not. It's given by people that, like us that make mistakes. Okay, so I think I was fair enough to Jacob. I criticized him many times in his face, and sometimes we went into big clashes because he was so sure that his numerics is right, but actually it's wrong. Anyway, so the story, so I will continue the story and, and let's see what happens now. So to explain what happens here is imagine that you have a uniform medium, and what you have in the medium is that you just change epsilon very, very fast on the order of one. So the way to write it properly. The response of the medium is that we write the, the electric displacement in time, and it looks like this. You need to look at the history from the time when time goes to minus infinity until present time, until t, let's say. Okay, and you look at all the delays, and you look at what happened as you turned on the electric field at some point until now. And how do you, uh, the response of the material that is accumulated? And uh, the Fourier transform of that looks like this, and this actually gives you an indication of what happens in terms of frequency. Now, usually we walk in this, we walk in the, under the assumption that the properties of the material are constant in time. So this means now that everything is simple. If they are constant in time, then this means that you can take epsilon out of the story. And what you get is a convolution integral, which means that in the frequency domain, we can just consider 
the electric field that uh, put C omega times epsilon. This is the usual way we teach our students in undergraduate and graduate. But here we are interested in exactly the opposite domain. When epsilon changes instantaneously, it's not constant in time, but it changes instantaneously. So the implication here is that the electric, electric displacement vector is the epsilon of time times the electric field of time. So there's no memory, unlike what happens here, there's no memory effect at all. On the other hand, everything is happening very, very fast. In reality, I dare say that this is in this regime for optical waves, yes, from frequency that 10 to the 14 and higher. Maybe it's impossible to be in this regime. You can approximate it, you can get near it. Why is that? Because to do that, you need to work with virtual transitions, with just the ground state and virtual transitions, the way that ordinary nonlinear optics works. And this means that all the changes in epsilon are going to be extremely small, and you cannot have really to be exactly in this regime in the optical domain. In microwaves, I dare say that it's extremely hard, probably not impossible, but extremely, extremely hard. In RF, I don't know, beyond my knowledge. So, okay, so let's now consider, first of all, what happens when you have a time boundary. So the way to think about this is first of all to learn from analogies. So if you have a space boundary, so we come in, you have an electron wave like this coming. Okay, so this is time and this is Z. It comes at some interface, let's say between air and glass. So we have a reflection, a uh, reflection that is here, and then we have also a computer wave, and you know exactly how to calculate that. Now let's do the same thing in time. So I want to emphasize that if this is dielectric, then energy is conserved. So therefore, the frequency of the reflected and the transmitted waves are the same as the instant. But let's do now the same thing when the material is completely homogeneous and you change epsilon abruptly in time, the time is equal to p naught. And we ask, what happens then? So what happens then? So you have your wave time, and now you change it. The material is uniform. Material being uniform means that momentum is conserved. Wave number is k is equal to omega over c, the speed of light. Now, this means that if the speed of light, speed of light in the medium, which is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the refractive index. If you change the refractive index, the frequency must change. If it is a monochromatic plane wave, this means that, the, that whatever is reflected or transmitted, these two, which I'll talk about in a moment, must have, must have a new frequency. And the new frequency is the old frequency times the, the old refractive index divided by the new refractive index. So if you change the fact limits by the order, let's say from, from one to two, what has happened is that the frequency now went down by factor of two. Okay, because momentum is concerned. This is one instance, one interesting effect that happens here. Okay, the other interesting effect is the following. So now you have two waves. One of them is time refracted. Okay, so it's a wave, momentum is concerned. So okay. Vector is concerned. So if you have a new frequency, but there's another one. This one will have mathematically a negative frequency, but there's nothing uh, negative, like negative frequency in the article. So what happens is that this actually, this wave is reflected not back in time, because we did not learn how to do back reflection in time as of yet. Maybe one day, when time will know how to do it. So it's reflected back in space. So this is extremely strange. Imagine that what you have is now a piece of bulk material. You have the wave going in, and then the change, the fact is, changes are dropped. Okay, so this wave continues now with some new frequency. This is the time refracted. But in addition to that, you have something that is emitted backwards. Etty, this is called time reflection. And the time reflection is going to have also that new frequency. Extremely strange. In order to see that, what you need to have is a sharp interface. Why is that? You want to see this. You need to have a sharp interface between, let's say, one material and the other. This interface needs to be within and one wavelength. If you do it slowly, the planet transmitted will continue to be completely transmitted, but the planet reflection will be going down to zero. Is diminished. This is called the polarization. So when we think about anti-reflection popping, this is one of the ways that we do anti-reflection popping. We just tackle that. Everybody knows, yes. Here, it works against us. It means that we have to do a very sharp time interface. We have to change epsilon within one cycle. Because if we don't, we will have time refraction, but we will lose the time reflection. 
This is a huge challenge when you do it from microwaves where it's global and it has been demonstrated recently in the optical domain. This is extremely high. We've been working with that for two years. Good morning, Yevgeny. Thank you for waking up for me. <laughs> Not for me. Anyway, so, so the, the idea, these ideas, actually one of them already belongs here in 2001. Okay. So what has been done experimentally? The first thing is like this, to look at, at a Doppler shifted, to look at time refraction, this, okay? was done, first of all, by a Shalai group, Shalai group, a group in 2016. It's not the same clue. This one is experiment, okay? And then about four years later, Bob Boyd did it, which is results that are not as good, but they gave them a fancy name. So he published it in Nature Communications. And uh, more recently, there were two, this is time refraction. Time reflection until last year has not been observed. Last year, Andrea Lu observed it. Actually, the paper appeared online in 2022, but it was um, it appeared in print only this year, 2023. And uh, now there's a paper that the delay is moved, and uh, and also by in Kildishev that uh, the, the group of uh, the the is did very nice work by him and the student, uh, former student Tom Jones. Um, very nice book. And I've been delaying it because I need to have some comments there. But hopefully, in a week it will go in. So, this is only the microwaves, which is extremely hard in itself. Okay. But in the optical domain, time reflection, uh, reflection of optical waves has never been observed. There's an error missing there. Okay. So, what was observed in time reflection? And the most interesting experiment, in my opinion, is this one. By a friend of mine, Matthias Fink, published in Nature Physics 2016, long before all the others. And what he did is like this: he realized Matthias knew about these ideas, and he knew that he's going to it is very hard to do it in electromagnetism, even though originally he's an optics guy. So what he did, he, he decided to do it with, with gravity waves in water, okay, surface waves in water. So what he did is he took a tank of water that looked like this, okay, and looked like a cup. But only bigger. <laughs> and then he filled it with water, and then he put some, some structure here on the surface. How do you do it? He is French, so he created a little statue of the Eiffel Tower and he dipped it in. So when you do that, what you can see immediately is that the water inside, you know, you dip it in, it's like putting your finger only with a more complicated structure. The water inside goes outwards. Okay, that creates time refraction. Also inwards, but inwards, there's almost nothing to do there. So just this is how you created the information, put the statue and it goes up. And then it dropped the water tank. Now, when you drop the water tank, now G is not, if you drop it, let's say three point, G does not play any role anymore. So you change the wave impedance in the medium. It's like changing epsilon here. So what happened immediately is time refraction and time reflection. The time refracted waves are the same wave that went out and continue to go out at different frequencies. But the time reflection is the wave that goes back with conjugate phase and we create the image of the statue of the Eiffel Tower. And this is what I'm going to see now. Okay. So let's look at this. Okay. So he puts it in. Okay. And then he moves it. So you see the outgoing waves. And, and then you know, he moves it. And then he drops the water tank and the okay. What at the time reflects the waves of water waves go back and recreate the statue. So this shows you that it's actually physical. It's not only mathematics and it carries information. It's not a plane wave, it carries information. This was a very nice demonstration 2016 by Matthias Fink. Now, Peter Alevi again did experiment here a year before, but he never really observed time reflection. He observed the presence of momentum band gaps in radio frequencies. So how do we handle this theoretically? So first of all, we have again to learn from photonic crystals. So again, photonic crystals, let's say one dimension, the refractive index changes periodically, it looks like, a, like this. And uh, you write the wave equation for the magnetic field. And the modes are block modes, which means that you have there, the, uh, there are block functions, there's some periodicity, and then you have functions that are block functions to the periodicity of the refractive index in the medium. And the outcome of that is, is uh, dispersion bands, Separated by gaps in frequency. 
in those things, in, in those gets here, uh, what is unique about the gets is that K momentum is complex. So photonic time crystal, which is the subject of this talk, is when you change the effective index, let's say 1D, change it periodically in time, for example, periodicity P, big P. The wave equation is similar, although not the same, but it's similar. The eigenmodes are now two k-modes. And what you get now is the two k-modes are functions that are the periodicity of the periodic changes in the medium, like these nickels. And the dispersion band, dispersion bands and gaps look rotated by 90 degrees. So now we have gaps that right here, the frequency is complex. That has major implications. So the physics here and here are completely different. And we will see in a moment why. So to understand what happens is let's think about what happens in a space lattice, first of all. Okay. So space lattice, dielectric to like a sandwich of a multi-layer system like this. You have an electron before it's coming, and then part of it is affected, part of it is transmitted. Let's look specifically at what happens in the gap. So the way to understand it is let's say that we have an atom that wants to radiate at the frequency that is exactly in the band gap. So this is my atom, and it wants to add the effect here. So if you solve this theoretically, what you find, you remember, it's in the gap. In the gap means that you have complex scale, complex momentum. Okay, and what does it mean, complex momentum? It means that it has two imaginary parts, and this means that the wave function will diverge with plus z and also with minus z. The system conserves energy, so the divergence here and here are not physical. And what you have is just the decay part. Okay, so the, your atom was a Coordinate z zero, then in the case to minus z and the case to plus z. So you get an evanescent wave. Now, if it decays like this, this means that the magnetic field here is also decaying, but it's shifted by pi over two phase shift, which means that the photon flux with time average over the quantum vector is zero. Is zero. It's not decaying twice faster, it's zero. This is really the definition of an evanescent wave, and this is what the Ablonovich is found. Okay. Of what happens in a photonic crystal is this only three. Now, what happens in our time crystal is not the same. Now, imagine that you have now a, an emitter of light that can give you only one blink of light, okay, like a delta function in time at some point in time, let's say T0, just one flicker of light, okay. Now, if the if, if the, this system is small enough, it will always be in the momentum gap, it's smaller than the wavelength, it's in the momentum gap, and as a result. The frequency is complex. Complex frequency means that as time goes by, the amplitude can grow exponentially or decay exponentially. This system does not conserve energy because you have broken time translation. Okay, you change in time. So, it, so energy is not an issue. It can grow or can decay, but it's physical. On the other hand, unfortunately, we cannot change the past. You see. You cannot go backwards. The flicker happens at time equal to T0. You cannot go back. So these pairs are not physical. As a result of that, what you can have is now that flicker of light that you have can be amplified by the modulation in the medium, extracting energy from the modulation, or can lose energy exponentially in time to the modulation, give away energy. And that is extremely interesting. And this is why the, the differences between them are actually fundamental. And the challenge is to be right here, to have something like that. Now, why is that? Because you can already imagine what will happen here. Classically, in quantum mechanics, okay, we work on that, but I can tell you the integration right away. When you see this, you understand what will happen. You can have a sensor, you have a little a flicker of, of light at somewhere, at some particular thing and some particular properties, then it will be amplified by the modulation in the medium. And then modulation in the medium can also generate spontaneous pairs of photons. So there are a huge number of applications here, lasers and all kinds of things. Just let us observe it, okay? So let's, let me now show you a little bit of a simulation of what happens. So the first simulation is to understand, to see, to get intuition. It's very easy to make mistakes. When you talk about time crystals and time varying media, very, very easy to make mistakes because we are not used to this kind of intuition. So the best way is to actually look at the simulation and the outcome. So what we did already in 2018, we, we launched a wave packet, a pulse like this in a time crystal, and we chose it to be a wave packet that first of all resides in the band. Okay, so what happens to it is the following. So this is time and space, so the wave packet goes like this. Okay, so it's a pulse, 
Oh, okay, and the case like this, it sits like this, so it goes like this. And then when you start the modulation of the time phase time, it splits your time refraction and time reflection, which means that during this time with the time phase time, you project it theoretically on the two K modes. And then when the time phase time ends, you again have time reflection, time refraction. Okay, so that's what you're going to see now. This is not extremely interesting, but it's easier to understand. Okay, so you'll see now it's F and here. It will go with the I'll show you to show again. It comes from here. This is when it starts. So it generates time reflection, time reflection. And when it ends, it generates another time reflection, time reflection. But you see, nothing special happens. Why? Because usually, when you launch it from the center of your brain, right here, then the slope is constant, more or less. So the path doesn't change the shape unless you go really close to the bend gap. So and the, it's not particularly interesting. Next one is what happens when you are in the gap. So now we've constructed a wave packet that is with momentum constituents that are in the gap. And we launch it right here. What will happen is that once you launch it and it came here, it's in the gap. So this means now that it stops. Pulse completely stops and the amplitude goes up. By the time the time crystal ends, then you create time reflection, time reflection. But as long as it is here, and you see it will go again, it is a marker, because of this, when it goes here, the pulse stops and the amplitude goes. Why? What happens is that you actually, you don't see, there is a one that is also decaying, but you don't see it. It's overwhelmed by the growth. So with this in mind, the way we started all this business is at the beginning, my student, uh, Iran Lustig noticed that if you change periodically time like this, it is similar to a, to a topological lattice, the simplest one, which is called the SSH lattice. When you change the factor index in space, you now you change it in time. And he said, well, let's try to generate a topological edge to the simple one. And how to understand this? Well, we know from the dispersion relation that when we adjust, we show the dispersion relation between energy and momentum, there's one more quantity that it hides and this topology of the band. The way to calculate it is to look for the very curvature and so on and so forth. And the way to think about, to visualize it in, you know, in your mind is to understand that if you look at this, normal to the phase front, it can be all of them pointing in the same direction, which means the political number is zero, or it can have a twist, one twist, two twist, three twist, and so forth, like a mobile swing. And this is the one where the political phase is five. And uh, so we calculated what happens here. And by the way, topological phase in one dimension, it's called the uh, Zach phase after my colleague that is now 92, 93, um, from the Technion, Yasha Zach. So, uh, so what is new in here? So what uh, Iran Lustig found at that time is that when you have a, a time boundary like this and you create the time crystal between, let's say, modulation in, in one modulation and then the other one with different periodicity or different contrast and so forth, you create time reflection, time refraction, and the re relation between the phases depends on the difference in topologies of the bands. And this was, uh, it was an interesting discovery. So interesting that it was discovered, it was rejected from PRA. And then uh, we predicted that you'll have an, an edge state, time, temporal edge state. So it's something that that's, uh, will come and launch a wave that is in the band gap. And then what happens is that it goes up. You know, it will go up, it's in the band gap. But then if you now modulate at some point in time, let's say T0, where you modulate it with a slightly different modulation, now you can create Something is going to decay. So you have an edge state in time. Completely unpredictable. Dimitri, yes, you can do it now in your system. Never been observed, and it will be beautiful, short frame. So after we did that, we said, okay, now let's see what happens when you take the modulation and put on some randomness in it. That was to make it periodic, but we put some variance in the magnitude. And let's see what happens. It turns out that this is intimately linked to Anderson localization. And what happens is that you launch a pulse, the pulse will stop. And what you see here is what happens to the group velocity when there's, there's no disorder at all. And then you launch something in the band, then, then it simply continues. But then you put some disorder, the group velocity down goes down to zero exponentially, and the pulse energy goes up. And I'm talking about something in the band. The fact that you put some disorder immediately stops it. So this is the similarity to Anderson localization. Both that are something related to what I did in 2007, but uh, 
There's also some major differences. For example, under some localization, there's no amplification whatsoever in the energy conserving system. And this one is. So a year later, in the last year, there was a paper by uh, Paul from the group of Matthias Pick. Matthias is now retired. It actually went and did everything I told you now in randomness. They did in the water tank again. And they observed it. They gave us nice credit, so I don't complain. I wish I could do the experiment myself. And um, I want to go back to the most interesting part, which is light emission in you know, time crystal. And again, this is the paper by Eli Donovich. This is really the game changer. And I remind you what he did. He looked at what happens in a photonic crystal when you have an emitter, an atom, or a quantum dot, or whatever emission that wants to emit at the frequency that is the band gap. And this is his paper then, and where he said something uh, that. Actually, you can actually suppress two times emission. Everything started from there. So you can see what the outcome right here. The outcome is that the prediction of the, if you have a laser without threshold, Oscar Painter, today a professor of Caltech, at that time he was a student of Amin Yarit, published a paper in 1999 about that, and Moda had a 3D, because this is 2D and this is three dimensional photonic crystallization to come. So, the question for us was let's look at light matter interactions. In a photonic time crystal. And the simplest effect, or the most dominant one, is what happens to spontaneous emission and similar emission. So let's understand it. So, first of all, let's understand classic that you have an antenna. Why? Because classically, we have intuition. Easy to make mistakes, also classically, here in this business. So, if you go first quantum, you get a nice set of equations, you understand nothing. It's better start classic. So what happens to a point source in a time in a photonic crystal in space? I wouldn't call you. What happens? You create, let's say, somewhere here, in the emitter, in the in the frequency gap. What you get is a magnetic point. Okay. So what happens to a time crystal like this? So we need to solve the equation and say at some point in time with a flip of light. The way to solve it properly is first of all to think about it that you have a wave that's going and it goes with some directionality. So for that, it needs to be a plane wave. Only then we can talk about a point source. So a plane wave, okay? So a plane wave, so we need to find actually the green function. And my student, Marco Bauer, found it. And uh, this is how it looks. Then we found the eigenmodes, and then we found the green function. And of course, the, the time P prime is when this flicker of light happens. And this is what it looks like. Now, if you think about whether it means, it means that you have something like a current source with some directionality, so it's an extended source, not a point source. Okay, and what you saw is something that we expected uh, naturally, I would say intuitively, is that if you have a flicker of light right here, then you couple now to the excited UK modes that one will be amplified exponentially, the other one will be exponentially. Okay, this is expected. So this is theoretically this is how it looks. We have a like a current sheet of current like this direction. And let's see what happens. Okay. So what happens now is the following. There are four cases. So this is my then yeah, this is the dispersion curve. This is the third band. Momentum band is the second band. In the momentum gap right here, we have the set frequency, which is exactly one half of the modulation frequency. Could you go back one slide? Yes. Yeah, question about this. Yeah. Okay. So you have a proportionality to the exponential in time, right? Mm -hmm. Are you showing this is, yeah, it's co it's a co coefficient. Never mind. So the coefficient has to have some, uh, yeah, yeah. This is the great one. There's a coefficient here, right? Yeah, that gives you the rise. No, it gives you the rise is that the frequency is complex. I said this is in the time crystal, frequency is complex, not the coefficient. Coefficient we can calculate, and then it goes from the pump. Yeah, yeah, exactly. energy is exchanged from the modulation into the. Okay, so now let's think about what happens. And so, so we have now a system, classical system, antenna, okay, extended source like this. And what we have here, first of all, in the blue, what you see is the uh, is the momentum bands, and in the red, so this is the real part of the momentum band, and the red is the imaginary part. Okay, so this is the first momentum band, and there is a gap here, momentum gap. So the frequency right here is set to one half of the modulation frequency, and this is the second momentum. And then, and there's a there's a second momentum gap, and so on and so. Forth. So, but let's ignore the rest. Let's just look at this. And we are interested in a source like this, an emitter or the antenna, 
that uh, two four possibilities. This is the first one. First one is that my antenna wants to emit exactly on the point of the dispersion curve right here. So it's in the band. Okay. So what happens to it? So what happens to it now? It is because it's right here, relation between momentum and frequency. It is phase matched to the modulation, and therefore the energy goes up. It looks parabolic, polynomial, never mind, it's not exponential. Second one is what happens here? If it emits right here, somewhere below. What happens now? It's not phase match, so as we can expect, because it's not phase match, we go back and forth, the energy goes back and forth between the modulation and your uh, and your emitter. Okay, expected. But what happens right here? So if your system, if your emitter now is right here, then you need to go to logarithmic scale, and now the energy goes up exponentially. So we plot it in logarithmic scale. And what's more interesting is right here that if it is not phase match right here, somewhere there. Then it still goes up exponentially. There is a some factor between them, but they are both exponential in time. So after 20 cycles, the energy accumulated is huge. So that gave us understanding that actually there's something very interesting going on. But the second question is okay, until now we did an extended source. Let's do it now with a point source, which is not very hard. Just take something that is an emitter or antenna that is smaller than the wavelength. So what happens then? So this is what happens then. You have some arbitrary source. Is what you need is just to look at the superposition of the, of, the, of the solution that you just found. And my arbitrary source wants to emit at this frequency. My source is smaller than the wavelength, wants to emit at this frequency. So notice what happens now. Some of it crosses right here the bands. Okay, so the photons or the, the, the energy will go up in some way. But the most interesting part is right here. Because right here it's in the gap and you, you always if it's smaller than the weather, it always covers all the momentum bands, at least the first two. So now there will always be something that falls on the gap. And what falls on the gap now is going to be amplified exponentially. And because the now the imaginary part, which is the rate of amplification now, has a peak right here, what will happen is that little by little it will become monochromatic. And this is exactly what happens when you simulate the events of what happens here. And you see, this is this shows you. As time goes by, for all the case, and you can see the color, what is the energy in the pulse? And you can see that at the beginning, you have some ripples also because of these points, there's some ripples here, and the others are not phase match, but then this is amplified and it becomes lower and lower and it becomes monochromatic. Yes, and is this still a one dimensional calculation? This is, yeah, this is one dimensional state. So, but actually, if it, you do, we also did three, mm -hmm. so it also happens in three. Okay. What, because the, the medium is homogeneous, so there's, the only difference is that in one D it's wave wave number, in three D it will be wave vector. All the ideas are the same. So in the paper we have also two things. Okay. So there are also other some interesting aspects here. What happens? Density of states. Okay, I want to show experiments also. So uh, then we went to the quantum. And the quantum description of this is actually to quantize it is quite tricky. So I will skip it. What we found is that you generate that every time you do modulation, you generate pairs of photons that are counter propagating. Why always pairs? Momentum is conserved. So when you generate new photons, because of the modulation, they have to be opposite in momentum, such that the total momentum added to the system is zero. So always have pairs of them. And you can see from the quantum calculation what happens to when you are, when you look at the number of photons that are generated in the band, which fluctuates like this. And in the gap, gap photons are uh, going um, up exponentially. And then there's the next question is okay, let us now calculate what happens if you put a two level atom inside. I can tell you it's an interesting calculation that we did not find a way to converge it. We can use Fermi Golden Rule to tell you the outcome, but we did not follow the diagram at all. It's, it diverges and incalculable. We tried all the tricks for my energy physics, normalization, blah, blah. So far, it didn't work. I'll be very happy if one of you solves it. But we can calculate the end result. So I want to go to the experiments in the last uh, 10 minutes. So I want to show, to tell you something like this. I, what, what did we find? So we find that there are three basic cases of emission in photonic time system. Oscillating linear exponential zone. Difference between emission in a, in a photonic crystal and photonic time crystal is that energy conservation versus causality. Dipole emission, antenna, always an uh, exponentially explodes 
regardless of frequency, it will depend on the dipole that is flowing the wavelength or so all the components in the momentum gap. Band edge is an exceptional point, and uh, emission in the gap becomes level every time. Monochromatic is time to infinity. Now you can think about constructing a resonator and have a preferential mode and have a photonic time crystal laser. Now we want to do photonic time crystals in the lab because we don't want to just generate a few interference. We want to go to unexplored territory, completely unexplored. So let's see what happens. First of all, before we go to time crystal, let's look at time reflection. So here I, I should update this one also that uh, Dimitri Peroli's group also observed this now recently. So why do we do? First of all, why? Why do we want to observe time reflection and time crystal in optical time reflection? And the answer is not because it was never, also because it was never observed, but also more interestingly, because it links to light matter interactions. Light matter interactions are the strongest in electronic transitions, and all electronic transitions are in the optical or near infrared. So, this is why we want to do it there. So, this is what we want to do. And the first time we proposed the system was in a, in a clear paper. And what we want is to be able to use some kind of a pump to change the epsilon by a lot. And the pump will be very, very short, maybe for 800 nanometers from the entire set of laser, and then drop the system in the near infrared, let's say 1500 or 1300 nanometers. So that's the idea. So we need to be in the single cycle regime. And if you want to look at the magnitude of the time reflection for different epsilon changes, then the nice time, if you see that if you use a probe at 1300, you'll see immediately that if even if you change epsilon by 0 0.8, much higher than that, I don't think will happen anytime soon. I don't know more than that, but it will still be if this is, you know, if you do it slower than a single cycle, this is single cycle here, then you are running into six orders of magnitude smaller. So you need to do it in a single cycle, but that's extremely hard. So what we did, we employed materials that are EMZ materials because we want to see a reflection, and the reflection is enhanced. When your epsilon is near zero. So there are many people that work for that, also Sasha and the Melbourne Gears and many, many others. So we had some ideas on that. We talked to Vlad and Sasha, and they sent us some material. And uh, the material is ENZ material. And this is, I think, uh, Vlad's paper in the time. And the idea was again, if you look at the nail reflection, it goes like one of the square root of epsilon. If epsilon goes closer to zero, you get very strongly enhanced reflection in space. So we can use a similar logic to also enhance the reflection in time. So let's do it. So we use these materials that are called the uh, epsilon near zero materials. What are they? These are materials that we, all, we always use to make transparent electrons. They're used in the industry. So if you think about the conductor, then there are conductors. And the bottom right here is filled with electrons, conduction electrons. And then we excite them up. We excite them up with a very strong, powerful pulse that comes from a tricephal laser. So you can, all those energy that are right here, the electrons will move to right here. Okay? So if every photon gives you one electron, what will happen is that the rate of this transition is proportional to the intensity. What matters in the end is the total density that you shifted from low energy to high energy. And this is an integral over the intensity of the pulse, which means it's proportional to pulse energy. So far, so good. So we expected that the rise would give us a big effect. The prediction was by many groups and by many experimentalists that when now you accept it in here, now the, the pump pulse is over, and then decays, it decays down to polons, to lattice vibrations. Lattice vibration means heat, temperature. And there's papers by Jacob Hogan that says that if you want to see a big effect, the material will never sustain it because everything goes to temperature. He wanted to be said something like, I don't know. A gigajoule, whatever number. I can tell you that our materials, we use them for two months in a row. And if one doesn't make a mistake, we can still use them. So that is wrong. This is unphysical. Actually, the mechanism that it goes down to photons, yes, we see that in the long term, but in the short term, we see something much faster, which is unexplained. So with this in mind, we started to do experiments because at the end of the day, we want to do experiments. And first of all, let's check literature. So everybody that did experiments on these kind of effects, what they had is look, they did measure uh, the fact that it was changes from 0 0.1 to 0 0.4, but always were around 80 to 100 femtoseconds. So this means that it has many, many, many periods 
on the temporal period of 1300, we didn't forget, it's 4.5, 10 to second. So you see that we are here very many periods, more than 20. Okay. So it will not see time reflection. And of course, nobody saw time reflection in the optical domain. With this in mind, what we did, we took the light coming from a short time style separate laser, which is about 80 10 per second. We passed it to a holocaust fiber that has neon gas inside. What the neon gas did, it expanded the spectrum to multiple form of mixing, and we get something that is now very, very broad. And then we use the trick that we learned from Andy. Mm -hmm. Andy and John Heritage, you probably, some of you don't know, but they invented the, all the method of pulse shaping, use the gating pair, and squeeze it down to about five times per second right here. Alter the phases and lock them together to five times per second. But then we illuminate with this uniformly this material. Now, material is fairly thin, unfortunately, and the reason is because well, in those materials, you always have some absorption. So, and the absorption is not. Uh, not negligible, so you cannot have something very thick. I wanted originally to use it as a wave that wrote the light like this, everything is absorbed. So we wrote it like this, and we don't want to inform it. Okay, this is our pump. This is how we change epsilon within five frames per second. And then from the same laser, we take the split part of it and we use parametric down conversion and we engineer a pulse that is much broader at a different wavelength, down 1500. And the 50 frame and 10 per second pass. Now we've moved recently to 1300, it's more convenient to work for whatever reason. And uh, we call the 10 per second, never mind. But for 1500, 5 frames per second is one cycle. So what we do right here with this is exactly one cycle, single cycle. And then we take this and we launch it here. And when we launch it here, you will see some planet reflection, and if you measure some planet transmission, which we measure, and if there's time reflection, it should go backwards in conjugate phase. Why doesn't it go exactly backwards? Because of its frequency shifting. As I said before, time re reflection and time refraction are frequency shifting. So what we did, we measured this, we didn't measure yet. There are too much noise in our system right now, but we measured the spectrum and the, and the power of this, and we measured the spectrum and the power of this. And this is what I'm going to show you. So what you see now is what happens when you have a spectrum, some just one abrupt change, okay? And the spectrum, so zero means when the, the, the everything that is before zero, this is the, the four parts and the modulator does not change anything yet. And then the modulator comes, index of fashion goes up, frequency goes down, so the wavelength goes up. So you can see here, the frequency translation goes up. And then at some point, pass is over, Pump is over, things you see, and you see relaxation, and then now frequency goes down and bounces not to the original value, but below. Okay, and the reason that we have this overlap of these two red shift and blue shift is because our profiles is too long. So that the edge of that will see, let's say, just the falling, just the falling of that. But you can so we play with this with modulation of different uh, uh, time scales. What you see already here, this is 28 times per second, which is multiple, uh, multiple cycles, and this is one and a half cycles. You can see right here, you see the redshift rises, and the right time it is on the order of 10 times per second. And the fall time right here, which is the blue shift, is, is large, and the slope is similar to this. So here, you can see it not strongly, but here you see it, it is really strong, and it goes down very quickly. Okay. So we see significant blue shift. Mind you, the blue shift that was predicted using funnels in the, was with a slope that is about 10 to 20 times slower. But here the slope of going up is the same as stuff from going down. Extremely surprising. So this you see in some set of data that we had in our paper. Recently we started the longest modulation to the shortest modulation. We can see immediately the shortest modulation is high amplitudes, change in the factor index is larger. I can tell you that within one cycle, within five times per second, we change now the effective index around 0 0.12. If you look at the total of that, which is about eight times per second, we change it by 0 0.2, the effective index. Next thing that happens is that, let's see the features within a single cycle. So this is my single cycle right here. Right here, that's the first single cycle. And you can see that when you go down in the modulation, we go down to short and short pulses, this is how much you have in a single cycle, 0 0.12. Quite a record in a single cycle. And then let's look at what happens 
uh, to the frequency shift, time refraction, and different modulation speeds. And what you see is that you see all of them. And the largest is when the part is the shortest, the modulation is the shortest at seven times a second. So there's a lot more that I want to say, and you can see that, that I will skip of that. And I will just want to end the talk with some questions that are really fundamental. So first of all, it goes like this. What is the, the most burning question is, what mechanism is that brings down the, the electrons down? It used to believe that what happens is hormones, which have led, would have led to Jacob Hormones results. Everything explodes. Obviously, it's untrue. It is something that is about 10, between 10 and 10 to 10 per second relaxation, and it cannot be hormones. What is it? Is it, uh, is it induced emission? There is a very good chance. This is not a pool of the system, rather, we have a continuum of levels here, continuum of levels here, and there is a, a region between them that is unpopular. In principle, it could be that what you have now is from higher energies here, go down into those unpopulated levels. So, there you do have population inversion, not a pool of system. To do that, what we need is to have a probe that tunes the frequency to that, and, and that we know. That's one question that is unresolved. You know, computationally, we can assume all kinds of things, but I'm not sure where is the, who is the truth. But then there are other questions that are also came down. One of them is those like this, okay? Uh, these materials are transparent conductors. Transparent conductors mean that they obey Ohm's law. Ohm's law is 10 to 3, yes? Ohm's law relies on Drude model. Drude, Drude is 1900. That means that an electron is not accelerated, rather the transport of current in solids is that the current is proportional or the velocity of the electrons or the current are proportional to the field. We all know that. Okay. But this relies on the fact that you have enough collisions with the ions. How much time does it take for collision and ions? So the lattice constant is all the solids is on the order of a few angstroms. Let's say five angstroms, four angstroms. Okay. And then how much time does the, the energy, the kinetic energy we know? Because we know how much energy we get to the conduction electrons. So we know how much, what is the average velocity. And let's say what happens. And I can tell you that when you calculate it, you'll find out that the time it takes between two collisions is on the order of one per second. But we are now in the single cycle regime. So what happens if we go down to one per second? Can we see are these ohmic conductors or are these ballistic conductors? What happens then? Can we see the physics coming alive? In very interesting questions. Another one, so this is this, this probe, this mm -hmm. is only conduction or conduction with these time scales, like time scale of duty. And then, you know, I told you already, these materials uh, go back to equilibrium via formulas. I think we see something different. Can the relaxation of electrons be here in this dimension? If we model the hot electrons and plasma, then comes in another question, which is what we do today. How fast can you? And modulate the new or can you establish the new plasma frequency? Is it instantaneous? So keep in mind that we are we know what happens when you bring them up. This explains that uh, the model explains very well. But how fast can you modulate the plasma frequency? Can the response in a few frames per second? And this is the final one, which is a very interesting frontier. We are not there yet, but we will be very shortly, I think. When you talk about a few frames per second, well, let's say one frame per second, uh, this is before collisions. To the ions. So now the signature of quantum anybody physics should be there. So, what happens now, for example, if we use uh, quantum light, we use squeeze light, moon states to do the excitation? Will we see the growth of entanglement in the system? There are many, many interesting questions. We are at a new frontier of physics. So, this is my last slide. Thank you for I listed our papers that have, found, have been published so far. Some of them are quite crazy, like this one about uh, solitons, gap solitons in the system that are very different than all gap solitons. But probably the most important one is this experimental one that we did with uh, Sasha and Vlad and several other uh, students from here. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things that in my opinion, the most important aspect of this photonic time crystal is light meter interactions in photonic time crystals. And there will be many applications and new physics. Thank you. Right, so questions? Yeah, maybe.
Yeah. Nobody said this is about the fast relaxation. Uh, you mentioned a lot about phonons, but in many systems with ultra fast excitation and lots of uh, charge carriers created. Uh, I'm used to hearing pictures about sort of first you create the car charge carriers and they're in a non thermal distribution, and that the first process that might happen is through electron electron collisions. They establish a temperature, so they establish some hot you know, thermal distribution. Okay. And then, sort of, slower time scale, uh, phonons take away energy and, and the temperature cools. And so, the, the first part, sort of in the pre phonon case, uh, you can still redistribute the electrons. And I don't know, but I would imagine there's uh, some effect. Uh, the sort of then the probe light will see kind of a different polar polarizability or something. So yeah. we looked at that in the numbers, and I'm not 100% sure that yeah. I'm right. So let me first of all explain. So what Andy says is the following: you created, you brought electrons to some energy spectrum. Okay. So you brought them to some region of energy. Let's say this region is very low. They're all in the same energy, but the electrons interact with one another, so they'll blow them. So what happens if they broaden it enough such that they the part of it starts to overlap to the bottom of conduction there? There's a problem that you need to broaden it enough. And the, the magnitude of the electron electron interaction so far, at least from what it looks to us, is not large enough to be able to bring it down close enough to the table. Mm -hmm. So oh, this yeah, is yeah. why, so uh, this is why we don't see it, but no, we don't know it. We need to do yeah. that, we need to do two things. One of them to throw it. To change the frequency of the of the flow, it's a wave packet, and then to make the wave packet network. So far, we didn't see evidence of that. So one more thing, uh, of course, it's important the role of electron electron scattering, but that changes momentum, but not uh, energy, not energy. frequency. In our case, we see a substantial energy. change in frequency in energy. So um, electron electron scattering. Scattering does change energy, not at the whole it broadens, but the individual particle, so it's broadens. It's broadens, it broadens, it broadens, it broadens but it doesn't bring them down. And we see that it brings them down. The broadens, yes. Okay, so you work through the different. We are not sure. Okay, yeah, no, it, it, it uh, seems to us from what we put numbers and so forth, it seems that this now doesn't happen. That they, okay. that they get that there, you know, those at the bottom and the, and the top. Even if you get some broadening, it will not be broad enough such as you bring them down. It brings down. What happens is that how much you change the plasma frequency? Really? So Sasha has a question. <laughs> oh, I don't have a question. I have a big thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Just a minute. Just a minute. No, no, no. But I want to announce something. <laughs> Sasha became a distinguished professor. That's what I'm just now. I have biggest thing to the entire team. The initiator, the initiators are there. One of them is the conspirators, is Dimitri, the other one is Andy. <laughs> they are the conspirators. I was just giving my acceptance speech, sending thanks to my dear husband, who was not there, <laughs> and to the entire team, um, and to you, Moti, for your support, and for you, Dimitri. That's amazing. Nice. It's, and yes, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed. Andy, I don't see you. I'm so overwhelmed. And I thank you so much for being such a great mentor for me all these years. And the credit goes to everyone. I, I don't know. It's all your brilliant mind. And Mahak has a question. It doesn't question the. My question is uh, in regard to the crystal and the exponential field. How is it different from the regular part that we also hear of exponential? Is it the fact that we see this exponential growth at different frequencies, not only at the resonance? Yeah, yeah. The parametric oscillators are resonant, resonant devices. They conserve energy and they conserve momentum. They conserve energy because the, the energy or the frequency. Of the pump is equal to the sum of the frequencies of the idle and the signal. They conserve momentum because of phase motion. That is, don't. They don't conserve energy and they don't conserve momentum. So in principle, you can do the pump in any frequency. We don't, it's not an instantaneous effect. As you saw now, we don't use a parametric oscillator right here. We use another form of energy. We change the plasma frequency. 
If there's nothing to do with not yours, it's not the kind of nominality, because the kind of nominality here will be too weak. You will get a change in the effective index of 10 to minus 4, 10 minus 5. And it doesn't conserve, and, and there's a bank here, which means that it doesn't conserve momentum. Any momentum state in the gap is amplified. So they're fundamentally different. I allow myself also to add here. Uh, I actually would respectfully disagree. Energy does increase in parametric oscillation, but basically, you, when you do it, it's, it increases. But the point is that parametric oscillator is phase sensitive. As what you pointed out, when you look at the band here, so uh, there is some point where it depends on the phase, but the point where it's not in phase. But it's for parametric oscillator, you always have to do it in phase, like this is weak. Otherwise, it doesn't do yeah. Here, uh, you see the effect of this increase in, uh, for example, immediate energy, uh, phase independent. And that's the fundamental difference. One is uh, phase dependent, another is phase independent. Even though there is also a point where there is phase dependence, as you pointed out when you look at the band. Yeah, yeah right? only at the band edge. There are some interesting other issues here that are very interesting. Another one, for example, is what happens when you, which is it could also a good question. What happens, for example, in the emission, when you are on in the band and you get closer to the closer of the band edge? Turns out that it depends how you prepare the time test. If you prepare the time crystal abruptly, or you prepare the time crystal at the apathic. In other words, the time either you start with zero and then you start the modulation, or you start the modulation in small steps. Okay. Why is that? Because one of them will be a full okay vacuum and the other one will be a real vacuum. Fundamentally different. The density of states for one of them goes to zero, the other one it explodes. Okay. Completely different, just depends on the preparation. There are all kinds of interesting, interesting effects there. Also, what happens to Cherenkov radiation there? Yeah, that that uh, doesn't There's a lot of interesting things. Absolutely, we feel we have by far more questions than answers. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is the beauty of this. Any other questions, challenges? Actually, both questions are very good. Yeah. Yeah. So early on, what you talked uh, about at least one of the models, you made the point of no memory. P of T equals epsilon mm -hmm. of T, uh, E of T. Yeah, we don't. Um, and, and so, you, so that's one way you can write it simply. Another way you can is in the uh, no time variation. So you have omega equals epsilon omega, yeah, well. omega. But the uh, question, uh, I, I wondered from time to time, what if they're both happening? What if you're sufficiently broad band that there's a you know, strong variation in the say epsilon and omega, but now you're changing with time. How do you formulate? So this is uh, I know how to formulate it, but it's hard to solve. So what yeah, we do now, you have to do that. Yeah. Do that right. so you need to solve that equation. So when it changes, okay. So when when, it, when the changes are like this, are close to instantaneous, which is where we are. We actually solve numerically. This is where my student Jonathan Sharabi had to write a new code for what is there in the FDTDs are not good enough. So actually, the, this is really the challenging part. Otherwise, it's it's much easier and to do it. The computation of this integral is tough. So yeah, yeah there is a lot of sense in that, and uh, we don't we know how to model it. But what happens when you have two the two extremes together? I'm not sure that today's tools are good enough. Somebody will develop the tool one day. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so uh, from what I understood, uh, like when you send a single photon in your media, it will create a pair of photons. Yes. And the single photon also exists. If the single photon is sent into the media. Yeah, that, let me show. So I told you that there's something that doesn't converge. This is this. Yeah, this. Okay. So what is here is the problem. Let's say that you have an atom in excited state. Okay, and that's it. Nothing. But that atom can emit one photon, go to ground state. Or it's a kind crystal, so that the atom can stay in the excited state and then photon pairs generated one forward, one backward. Okay. And then it can go down and emit a photon, and then it can go down, down, go down to here. Okay. Or by annihilating two photons. So you can not only generate into photons, but can annihilate. So this is the diagram, and it really doesn't convert. So that's a Gedanken experiment. We know how to calculate by Fermi Bullwood the outcome under some conditions. But if you send a single photon from outside, yeah, well, this is the same. Oh, if you ask what is the create induced emission, 
The answer is yes. It creates a single photon, creates something like induced emission. It's not induced emission in the usual sense, in the usual sense of population inversion and so forth. It's induced. That photon will be amplified if it fits in the band gap, like backward and forward and backward. Okay. And refine means to uh, change without the frequency. just say if you change the frequency that it also amplifies. Okay. Also amplifies, in other words, you're at two and uh, two and four and six, uh, two and four and eight and so on exponentially, and also backwards by the modulation. Even if the medium is no atomic resonance whatsoever, we wrote that in the paper. Actually, you can get now amplification just by the modulation. It would create new photons or not. Yeah, it does. The, the, if the if your photon comes in from a source, goes in the direction that belongs to the momentum band gap, it is amplified. So the medium, okay, you change one photon, let's say in this direction, in the direction of the band gap, momentum gap. So the medium, what will happen, the medium changes, the modulation changes the frequency and generates now we have two photons here and one here. And they continue to modulate, and now we will have. Now, in the same frequency now, because it's in the modulation, now we have four here and four here. So, this question, because, uh, like, uh, if you can copy your photons to uh, some extent, uh, there is no common theorem in quantum which uh, prohibits, like, uh, existence of uh, such things. Okay. Okay. So, uh, if you can think about it, another step after that, can you use that to generate cluster states? The answer is yes. <laughs> to the cluster states, even. So, there are some ways you need to do. Exactly along these lines. This is exactly the question that I asked. And my student Mark came up with a very interesting scheme how to use it to generate cluster states. Cluster states means that now every photon that you generated is now quantum correlated, is entangled with the photon before it and after it. That's one D. And hopefully that's a two D. So theoretically on one D we know, hopefully in two D also. So it's exactly goes to this. You can use it to generate entanglement. Life is interesting. All right, so uh, uh, okay. I'm not supposed to say this. This is not official yet, but uh, it's circulated, and I thought it would be a good moment to announce it, even though it is like it before it becomes official, like a secret. So, as you know, Mori uh, has been for three years uh, distinguished. Uh, he loves and professor of college of engineering and it's particularly it's over now but the news which i'm about to say which percolated but not official yet it's going to be extended for two more years so what are going to come regularly here keep cooperating with folks here and that's the great news because uh because we have advantage of collaborating with money and also is money is a great ambassador for Purdue but when he goes out he tells what he's doing this and from what I could judge, he actually uh, thinks and speaks quite highly of Purdue. So, in all regards, it's a win win situation. Please join me uh, in thanking Moody for his great talk and also uh, celebrate these two more years of strong collaboration. All right, so. Hello,